All right. Hey, why don't you have a seat? And we're gonna get started. Why don't we thank the band? That was fantastic. You guys are sounding good. It's like you rehearsed or something. That's good. Uh, I want to say a big hello to all the campuses that are tuning in via the internet. It's pretty cool. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the, the prison ministry, the prison network. What's up, guys? How are you? That is so cool. I love what this church is doing. Uh, this is just, I'm getting goosebumps at the front. I'm like, I want to be here. That's it, I'm moving to Napa, it's happening. That's so cool. You know, you could serve God in worse places. Like, you don't live in a horrible, you know, Cowville is pretty cool. Dude, I'm Canadian. Okay, it's, it gets cold in Canada. Uh, I, would, I would have loved to have grown up here. And I, we, did a, we did a drive yesterday um, to, was it called Calistoga? Am I saying that right? But we went out and, you know, stopped in little village, all the little villages. I felt like my mom, oh, honey, let's pull over. I was driving with Jude. It was a bromantical... Vac vacation of sorts yesterday. I was supposed to play golf with Pastor Dave, but my back is injured. I pulled my back playing golf. Um, so, I, yeah, it was sad. Tears, many tears were shed. Uh, but we went out, and we were stopping at all the, the little villages, honey pullover, and it was cool. We ate a delicious lunch, and, uh, and then we drove back the back roads that makes Sierra sick, apparently, because it's too windy. And we, I saw where all your water is gone. <laughs> we pulled over, did the sign of the cross over it. <laughs> Pretty cool. You guys live in a really great area, and um, it's, it's just a treat to be here. So thank you for having me, Pastor Dave and, and Jude. We had fun on Friday night, and um, this is cool. Are you glad to be in church? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, today, if you're taking notes, uh, the title of this talk I'm gonna, we're going to call it, it's like a TED Talk, kind of. Um, no, it's not a TED Talk. But um, the title of, of, of the message this morning is, Where's the Faith? Where's the Faith? And, um, and we're going we're gonna to take a look at, at the topic of, of faith. I don't know about you. Um, so I'm, I'm from a charismatic background. My dad is a, is a pastor, an MFI pastor. It might mean something to you or maybe not. Um, it's, a, it's a, a church network from Portland, Oregon, and, and um, all that to say, I, I grew up in a, in a church that we talked about faith a lot, and um, I, remember, I remember being, you know, six, seven, eight years old and, and hearing people talk about faith a lot, and, and I was imp most impressed by faith. It sounded like Jedi powers, to be quite honest with you, so I imagine it, you know, like... With faith, you could move mountains, you know? Like, <laughs> you know when Darth Vader does that and things just move? It's like, I would love that kind of power. I love being a Christian. <laughs> um, and I remember, I remember um, you know, just trying to wrap my head around the concept. And, and I, would, I would, you know, I'd, I'd believe, you know, because everything, you know, nothing is impossible for those that believe. And so I'd just I'd close my eyes really hard and... You know, just believe God for that drum set or whatever it was um, as a kid. And, and um, some, you know, I did get the drum set, but, but, um, but sometimes, my, not all of my prayers were answered. Sometimes mountains didn't move. Um, I grew up in a, a, a pretty strict Christian home. And one of the things that strict Christian homes do is they even, like, go to Christian vacations my family, we would go to uh, Chesley Lake Christian Camp. We'd go there for two weeks every summer. And Chesley Lake is like this typical kind of Canadian lake camp. You know, you got a dock, and you got a lake, and people, you know, ride around on their boats. And every year, from as long as I could remember, you know, I'd, I'd go out. Because I took this faith stuff seriously. You know, I was a kid who believed everything that the pastor said. 
And for the most part, I think I still do. Um, but wrapping my head around this faith thing was so, I mean, I remember when I was about six or seven years old, we, we, we did a, a message on faith in, the, um, in, in Sunday school, and we gave out these little um, baggies of mustard seeds. And the, the, the lesson was about how if you just have faith the size of a mustard seed, and mustard seeds are really tiny. If you just have faith, we're giving out these little, I remember these little dime bag mustard seeds. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay. My parents are like, what is that? <laughs> Confiscating it. It's like, it's my faith bag. Get your paws off, father. And so I'm like looking at these seeds. I'm like, dude, I absolutely have that much. Are you kidding me right now? It's so small. I have at least 10 times that, you know? You could, you could move mountains if you just have faith the size of a mustard seed. You could say to the mountain, be removed, you know. And then I remember another faith story. I mean, this is a big one. Whenever anybody would talk about faith at church, they'd talk about Peter walking on water. And, and you know, he, he, he walked on water. That's insane. So, I'm, so I'm, I'm seven, eight, nine years old, whatever it is. I'm at the dock. And every summer, I'd be at our dock at Chesley Lake Camp, right? And I'm like, I remember dangling my skinny little Canadian legs, you know? And, and I remember just the top of my, every summer I'd do this, and I'd, da and I'd dangle, and, and my feet would touch the, just the top of the, ooh, touching the top of the water, you know? And I'm like, this is the summer, this is the summer. My parents are not gonna believe this, it's going to happen, you know, like I have faith for this. At least 10 mustard seeds of faith. <laughs> and every year I got soaking wet. <laughs> and that's, you know, that was pretty devastating, to be quite honest with you. You know, for, for somebody who like really believed and, and, was con I, and, you know, I believe, I believe that God is real. I believe that his words are true. And, but, like, what was wrong? Right. I didn't understand what was wrong. Have you ever been in that place with faith where you're like, I'm believing for this. Why is this happening? This is clearly the will of God. Here's a scriptural story to back it up. Right? And it can be a bit traumatic to use a, a word that we love to throw around these days. You know, it's like, so I, you know, about the age of six, seven, I started the slow march towards the old cynic. By the time I was 11, I'm like, faith. <laughs> you know, don't you talk to me about faith. Faith is the real F word around here. I am soaking wet. You know, just trying to live a life of faith over here, God. So I've been, to be honest with you, I've been on this journey just trying to figure out this faith enigma as a believer. How does this work? And if there are these promises of faith, how come they don't manifest the way that I'm expecting them to manifest? And I, and I suppose that's sort of the give right there. That's the tell, that my expectations are, maybe it's about me. Um... Let's throw up our first verse. Let's throw up our first verse. This is a text that I used to hear a lot about faith, and, and maybe you've heard this one preached before. And um, we're, Matthew, I believe it's Matthew and Mark that both tell this story. Um, and so in Mark here, Mark is probably the first gospel that was written. Um, and in this story, it's, the backdrop of this story is Jesus' rejection in his hometown in Nazareth. And essentially what happens is Jesus is just the local kid who is the son of the carpenter. And like he kind of, then he kind of shows up and he's like, you know, teaching and he's like this rabbi and it's like, yeah, your dad's a carpenter, you phony. You know what I mean? Like, they're just like, dude, you, are you kidding me? Like, you, you worked on my furniture. You're not the Messiah. You, you know what I mean? 
Like, one of the, the, chair, the chairs is busted, okay? <laughs> might, be, might be the Messiah, but a horrible carpenter, you know? <laughs> I'm just riffing. Um, So there's some familiarity in, in Nazareth. A and these people don't believe that Jesus is who he says he is, right, because of that familiarity. And so it says he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a, on a few sick people and healed them. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty impressive, Dude, if I laid my hands on a few sick people today, we'd be freaking out. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, you know, you, you know, come here. <clears throat> you know, you're just like, I can see, you know. If people just start getting just a few, I mean, if one person got healed, we'd be like, God is real. <laughs> but oftentimes, the way that this verse is preached is our faith limits God. And the problem is, is that it's directed at people who are Christians. But the background of this story is it's not people who are Christians. It's people who just didn't believe in Jesus. So, of course, Jesus is going to go, okay, cool, you, you don't believe in me? You reject me? That's fine. But I'm going to heal Joe over here and Sally, you know? The parallel verse here in Matthew 13. So Matthew's telling the same story that Mark's telling. Same thing. He did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, one, once again, just stay with me here. It's not Christians who were struggling with, some, with their faith. People who already believe in Jesus. Are you following me here? We're talking about people who've just rejected Jesus categorically. And then, of course, Jesus, okay, cool, you don't want me around, I'll leave. But Jesus, this, this verse isn't depicting people who believe in Jesus, but sometimes struggle to believe if God will show up for them. Do you see the difference? Okay. In the Gospels, there are four instances where Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. And so this morning, I want to take a look at all four. Okay? And because I think that a lot of times we, when, we're talk, when we're thinking about faith or talking about faith, we're putting a lot of pressure on ourselves. And faith doesn't really have much to do with you. And we know this because if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say that the mountains be removed. Right? So Jesus is saying, your amount of faith isn't really the problem. You hearing me? But oftentimes I've heard the opposite. And then I think it brings condemnation and just a strange feeling towards God, like maybe I'm the problem, there's something wrong with me. Have you ever talked to somebody who's sort of bought into that? Right? You ever, you ever met somebody and they're like, you know, you're like, hey man, how are you? You know, are, I heard you're sick. No, I'm not sick. <laughs> Dude, you have COVID. <laughs> no, no, I do not. I am walking in faith and victory right now. <laughs> right? Bro, how are you? I heard that you got bit by a shark and you're missing a leg. Nope, nope, my leg is coming back in Jesus' name. That's a bad confession. You know, it's like, dude, you're being weird. Right? I don't think that Jesus has called us to be weird. <laughs> like, <laughs> admitting that you're sick isn't a lack of faith. Right? Admitting that you have a need isn't, a, in fact, admitting that you have a need is the prerequisite to get help from Jesus. <laughs> Not the opposite. But there's been maybe some, sometimes some confusion about faith that, no, you have to just, you have to say that you don't need anything and, that, and, and then everything will manifest as you articulate it. I don't know if that's faith. Okay, let's, let's look at this scripture verse here in Matthew 6. This is our first, oh, you have little faith. This is such a great verse. Jesus is talking, and he says this, if God so clothes 
the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? What a great thought. And Jesus is saying, dude, God's going to take care of you. God's going to take care of you. And it, it sort of isn't really dependent on your faith. You have such little faith, but God's going to... Does the grass have faith that God's going to clothe it? Not really. It's an inanimate object. <laughs> right? And God's just sovereign. And provident is a better word. Right? He's provident. And he takes care of the grass. And if God will take care of the grass, he'll take care of you. And that is it's, what Jesus is saying is, think of God's providence. God cares about creation. And that thought that God cares about creation, how much more does he care for you? That ought to evoke a little bit of faith. God, I'm going to be okay. But you, you see, your faith isn't the issue. If you just have a little bit of faith, God's going to do it. Pretty cool. Don't need big faith. Just, just, just a little. Just believe God a little bit. Have that posture of you. You can do this. You will do this. You're gonna take care of me. Okay, let's go to our next verse. Matthew chapter eight, verse twenty-six. And Jesus said to them, "Why are you afraid? Oh, you have little faith." Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea. This is the story where Jesus is asleep in the boat, and there's a huge storm, and the disciples are freaking out. And they're like, we're going to die, we're going to die. So they wake Jesus up, and Jesus comes out, and, and he rebukes them. And he tells them that they have a little bit of faith, and then he sorts out the wind and the waves. He rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. Jesus did the miracle in spite of their little faith. Right, these guys, I, I mean, they had no faith. We're going to die. They're, that's a bad confession. <laughs> they're, not, they're not praying. They're just, they're cursing. Right? But Jesus wakes up. Guys, I... He just rolls his eyes. You guys literally suck right now. <laughs> I'm going to save you. How good is Jesus? Yeah. See, I identify with that, more, sadly, more than not. Right? Times in my life where I'm just like, everything is horrible! And Jesus is just rolling his eyes at me. And then he sorts it, right? Have you ever been in this situation where you've been like... You know, this is, everything's going to hell in a handbasket, right? And then like a day later or two days later or a week later, Jesus sorts it out. And then you're like, God, I'm sorry. <laughs> Have you ever been there? <laughs> it's embarrassing. But he's so patient and he's so kind. And when he sorts it out, it's just a reminder, Lord, I'm sorry. It, it, it writes an opportunity to repent and just say, I, I need to trust you more. Okay, next verse. Um, they began discussing among themselves, saying, uh, we brought no bread. Now, this is right after Jesus fed the 5,000. Right after he fed the 5,000. And remember, the disciples hadn't brought any bread for, for 5,000 people. They didn't know that they were going to need to feed 5,000 people. And so Jesus sort of says to them, um, you know, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. It's kind of like a, he just, it was sort of like he had a thought and then he didn't finish it. And so then they began to discuss among themselves, we brought no bread. You know, that's, so Jesus is upset at us. That's, he's speaking, it's like a, it's code for bring bread on ministry trips. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like you have one job, you guys aren't doing any of the healing around here, can you just at least bring some French bread? <laughs> that I could multiply. I had, to, I had to use a volunteer, the kid was seven. <laughs> had he not brought lunch, we would have been totally... <laughs> it's 
right? So they're just like, oh, we're the worst ministry partners ever. <laughs> they don't understand what Jesus is saying. They don't have, you kind of need some faith for revelation. And they don't have any revelation. They don't, they don't understand what Jesus is getting at because they're sort of thinking in the natural and not in the spiritual. And that's a really easy trap to get into as well, right? Oftentimes, one of the, the reasons why we don't hear God is because we have, we have um, a, a listening list. You know, we have these listening expectations. And we're wanting God to speak to us about this, but God's not speaking to us about this. He's not really interested in that. He's interested in speaking to us about this, right? And, 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 and so, yeah, when you come to God and you're going, oh, yeah, I'm just, and oftentimes people will be like, I'm just in a really real silent season right now. Like, God's just not speaking to me at all. It's like, dude, he is speaking to you. He's just not talking about the things you want to talk about. <laughs> God has priorities in conversation, right? And so this is one of those situations where Jesus has a, as a priority. He's trying to, he's trying to raise <laughs> spiritual leaders, <laughs> not bakers. Right? They're conscious of this physical need. He's conscious of their spiritual need. And because of their lack of faith or understanding, they're not getting it. And so Jesus, aware of this, he says, oh, you of little faith. Right? Faith isn't just about our physical need. It can also be about our spiritual need. Oh, you of little faith. Why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Just, uh. I picked some winners. <laughs> and later on in this, as, as, if, you continue, if we continue to read, we'll find that they get the revelation. Jesus will explain it to them. Oh, okay, okay, I got you. They have a little bit of faith, but Jesus shows up and he helps. Jesus, so far, three to four, he's not intimidated or limited by our little faith. Did Jesus need our faith when he spoke the worlds into existence? Now, absolutely, God wants to partner with us. Right? And he, he, he wants to, once again, we're not talking about people who just categorically reject God. We're talking about people who believe in Jesus, but we're struggling. Right, which probably we could put all of ourselves, myself included, in that category. Right, it's like God, I believe you, but I struggle. Right. Jesus has an authoritative word. He has this ability to just speak things into existence, and he doesn't need your help. And I love that because my help sucks. <laughs> right, I, I'm like. Um, it's like painting a, a, a white picket fence and, and there's dad and like a two or three year old. Right? I'm the two or three year old and I, I got the paint all over me. All in my hair. Right? Painting my shoes. Painting the sidewalk. And, and I think that I'm painting the fence but really dad's painting the fence <laughs> and I'm painting... That's my walk with Jesus. You hear me? Yeah. Right, Jesus is doing it, and I think, oh, I am doing it. <laughs> yeah, you're doing, just keep moving, you're doing a great job. <laughs> we are, I am so spiritual. Yes, you are. Wow. <laughs> All right. Before we get to our fourth, oh, you little faith, I want to do a little Romans 10 interlude. Romans chapter 10 is fascinating. And it, and it tells us about where faith comes from, which is important. Um, if we're going to know how we're supposed to operate in faith. Um, 
So faith comes from hearing. And actually, the context of Romans chapter 10 is preaching, and specifically preaching the Bible. And so faith comes from hearing. Faith comes sorry, from hearing. And hearing through the word of Christ, through the word of Jesus. Faith doesn't start with me. It, it doesn't begin with me. Faith is not assumption then. Because faith, it comes. It doesn't be, right, you right, you, you hear me. Okay, I want a Cadillac Escalade. Right now, I drive a Toyota, a 2016 Toyota RAV4. It's very Dave Ramsey of me. <clears throat> I'm, I'm acting my wage. Right? Act, babe, we're acting our wage, okay? We don't make Cadillac Escalade money. We make Toyota RAV4 money, okay? I paid cash for it. I paid $14,000 for it. Praise God. <laughs> Thank you. You're doing so good, young preacher. <laughs> We're learning this new thing called saving money. It's insane. Um, and so we, drove, we drive the Toyota RAV4. And like 2016 Toyota RAV4, you know, when you pull up into a parking lot with a Toyota RAV4, nobody looks at you. They don't make eye contact with you. You're just like, oh, he's doing pretty well. You know, like. And to be honest with you, the Toyota RAV4, it's like, it's, it's faithful. It's a Toyota. It's going to start every time. Like, praise God for that. Reliability. It's great. God bless Japan. <laughs> Geniuses. But, like, it's not a fun vehicle to drive. And I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get to the place in my life where I'd like to drive something a little bit bigger and a little bit more fun, okay? But I don't make t the Cadillac Escalade money. Now, faith comes by hearing, Okay? I can't pray a prayer of faith for a Cadillac Escalade unless the Lord's told me that I can have a Cadillac Escalade. You hear me? Now, I will pray a prayer of hope. <laughs> and hope does not disappoint. You hear me? But, you know, to, 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 to assume that God wants me to have the Escalade is exactly that. It's assumption. It's presumption, and it's not faith. Faith comes by hearing. You hearing me? I think that, I think that what had happened to me in my faith journey, and trying to figure out this difference between faith and hope and and what faith is, is that early on in my faith journey, I didn't realize that, A, faith came, it, it didn't come from me. It wasn't my assumptions, my presumptions. It's not speculation. It comes from God. And so I can have faith. If you look through Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, it is all people who got a word from God. All of them, right? Noah didn't have a dream about building a boat, and he just manifested it. God told Noah, build this thing. He's like, I've never even heard of it. Just do it. That's faith. You hearing me? Right? Abraham, he's the father of faith. And God told Abraham, leave your home and start walking. He's like, okay. Abraham was 75. I like to remind young people that when God decided to change the world, he started with an old man. <laughs> right? Usually we save those messages for the young people. You're, you're going to change the world. Well, Abraham was 75. He changed the world. <laughs> but don't miss it here. God waited until Abraham was dead. 75. <laughs> Right, Abraham's like, I, my life is over. 
I'm not young anymore. I'm not strong anymore. And God's like, perfect. You have no more dreams. Awesome. <laughs> See, faith isn't about you. It's not about you manifesting what you want. Faith is about what God wants. And then just obeying him because you're at the end of your rope. Right? You're just like, okay, I'm 75. <sighs> you know? And God's like, oh, I love this guy. He is depressed and discouraged. I'm going to get all the glory. I'm in. In Genesis chapter 11, God rejects the people of the world at, at Babel. They're, they have all these wise, you know, uh, strategies and schemes to manipulate God. They're building this ziggurat, which is like this, this it's not even that high. It's like f five stories high. <laughs> and if you read in the original language, they're making fun of them. They're just like, yeah, they were using really bad bricks too. Like this was their best technology. <laughs> right? And God's just like, your tower sucks. I'm not going into your tower. The reason why they were building this tower was because they're trying to get God to come down so that they can manipulate him to make him do whatever they want. Which we, that's what we try to do. Yeah. Like, God, my life is so sick. Be a part of it. <laughs> <clears throat> right? <laughs> I am so cute. I'm so smart. I have an amazing TikTok channel. God, be a part of my life. I'm doing insane things for you. You need to get on board, Jesus. <laughs> and, and so God's just like, yeah, no. And he goes and finds this 75-year-old guy who will just believe him. Abraham's like, I got no life. And, and, Abraham's, and God's like, I know. And God's like, just leave and just start walking. <laughs> and he's like, really? Just, you wouldn't even maybe... Like, yeah, like, is there, a, is there a Denny's? Is there, is, you know, nothing. Just start walking. And Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He just believed him. See, that's faith. That's why he's the father of faith. And Abraham, I love Abraham's story because he keeps on making mistakes. He, his, his faith journey was imperfect. Didn't have it all together. Abraham ends up making an idol of the promise that God gave him, which is crazy to think about. God told Abraham, you know, through, you know, you're going to have a baby with Sarah. And God's like, well, Sarah's dead too. <laughs> She's old, you know, like I'm old. Is this a, is this a cruel joke? And, you know, no, 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 it's going to be through Sarah. Well, you know, then Sarah's like, well, this is clearly, we're getting older. We're, nobody's getting pregnant here. So, you know, why don't you hook up with my, my friend and have the baby through her? She's much younger, you know. And Abraham's like, okay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds like a God idea. I have faith for that. <laughs> of course, this bonehead decision torpedoes his relationship with Sarah. It majorly backfires. <laughs> it's like, what were you thinking? He's constantly trying to make things happen in his own timing and his right. And God's just... So God shows up again. He's like, no, for, okay, dude, dude, dude. He's like, I'm, no, it's going to be through Sarah. And he's like, yeah, so we're like really old now. You know, we're basically dead. That's literally what Abraham says. And God's like, no, it's going to happen. Sarah's listening through the tent when God's telling Abraham. It's, you know, the baby's going to come. Sarah, Sarah's going to be the mom. And Sarah makes a dirty joke in her mind. If you read it, I'm not going to say it. 
but go back and read it in Genesis. She's like, you know, like, oh, I'm going to have pleasure with Abraham too, you know, at my age. God goes, I heard that. I, I heard that. And the amazing, what, what incredibly happens is, is that you know, they, have, they, they just have a little bit of faith. It's imperfect. They're making mistakes along the way, but God doesn't throw them out. He just continues with them because they just keep believing, keep leaning into the promise. And the baby comes and it heals not only Abraham's marriage, but it heals Abraham's life. He begins to, you know, Abraham was not always strong in faith. He, he grew in faith. You remember one of the last Abraham stories where God tells him, okay, you know that son that I gave you? I want you to go and I want you to sacrifice him on, on Mount Moriah. And the Bible says that the next day Abraham woke up early. I would have slept in that day. <laughs> right? But Abraham has gotten so good at just believing God that he knows that God's going to sort it out. He, see, he grew in faith. I think that the reason why I was getting wet, soaking wet at, the, at Chesley Lake Camp all those years was because God didn't tell me to be Peter. I was copying the faith act of somebody else. And I just ended up disappointed and upset. But I think that, see, God wants, God has a word for you. It's, it's unique for you. He wants to speak to you. He's speaking to you. At all times, he's speaking to you. Once again, maybe it's not what you want to hear, but it, he's speaking to things for you. And they don't look like anybody else. They look like you. And we're all on that journey like Abraham of just learning to trust the Lord. Not presuming, not assuming, but just listening for his voice. And if we, can just, if we can just do that, we can, we can just hear him. Like really, the honest is, is on hearing God because if faith comes by hearing, if I could just hear him and I have a little bit of faith for it, it will happen. Our last story is in Matthew 14. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. And um, he, he made them get in the boat, probably because they saw a storm coming, and they're professional fishermen. They're like, yeah, we don't, we don't want to get caught in a storm again. But he makes them get in, and he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain to him, uh, by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat, by this time, was a long way from the land. It was beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, which is about 3 o'clock in the morning, he comes to them. And this is crazy. He's walking on the sea. And he knows he's going to freak them out. Right? But he's doing it anyways. I think he's laughing under his breath. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. <laughs> and they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. And immediately Jesus is like, calm down. It, it's, it's me. Don't be afraid. And Peter answered him. Now, what do we know about Peter? He's a chicken. He's always a chicken. He's even a chicken in the book of Galatians. Paul's like, Peter's a chicken. Right? And he's always trying to save his bacon. That's Peter. And so Peter sees Jesus. The boat's going down. Jesus is walking on water. And Peter's just like, he's the safest person to be with. This boat sucks. I'm, I'm out of here, right? So he says, Lord, if it's you, command, command me to come to you on the water, as in, I'm not going to drown if I'm with you, <laughs> right? And so Jesus is like, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Um, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately raised out his hand, took hold of him, and saying to him, oh, you a little faith. Right, he's got a little bit of faith, but Jesus saves him. 
Why did you doubt? And, and, and they got into the boat. The wind ceased and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Now, the point of the passage is that Jesus is revealed as the Son of God. The point of the passage isn't that Peter, who was a chicken, got out of the boat to try to save himself, which is really actually how, for most of church history, we taught that verse. Now, at times, you know, Peter was able to walk on water because Jesus told him, come. Right? So he had faith for that. The other 11 in the boat had faith for the boat because Jesus told them, get in the boat. Sometimes, it's, um, sometimes it takes a lot more faith to stay in the boat when Jesus told you to be in the boat. But they all had faith. Their faith looks different. You hear me? Last verse and we're done. This is one of my favorite verses. They brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. This kid had a demon or some, some sort of unclean spirit. And he fell on the ground and he rolled about foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has he been listening to Nickelback? That's ridiculous. <laughs> That was a cheap joke. I saw my chance, I had to take it. How long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. Uh, but if he can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe. Help my unbelief. Why don't you stand with me? And of course, Jesus casts the demon out. But I believe. Help my unbelief. I think that's where most of us are at today. God, I believe. Help my unbelief. You know, God, I'm with you. Jesus, I believe you. I, you know, I, I've received you. I, I believe, but help my unbelief, God. Aren't you glad that it's just faith that's the size of a mustard seed? Aren't you glad that Jesus just comes in and rolls his eyes and just says, oh, you're a little faith. And he sorts things out. Doesn't that sort of just make you thankful today? But oh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you that this isn't all on me. Thank you that you're God. Thank you that you're in charge. Thank you that you care. Thank you that you're provident, Father. Father, thank you for Jesus. Lord, thank you that you intervene. Father, thank you for your spirit. Thank you that you know what we're going through and you identify with us and it's not all on us. It's on you, Lord. And we put it back on you today.